Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. I'm Annabelle Bateman. And before I get into introducing my guest today, Dr. Emily Kybird, and we're talking all about strength, strength training, exercise, you know, and challenges that those of us with uh, Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism have with maintaining muscle mass and uh, joint pain and things like that. I just want to give you a bit of an update. I've got some exciting news. Uh, If you've been listening for a little while, you'll know that I've been writing a book for the last uh, bit over a year now. Uh, It's called Kiss and Make Up with Your Thyroid. And I've just sent off in the last week for a proof copy. So I'm really excited. We're getting closer to launch. Keep an eye out and an ear out for uh, pre-sales. So if you're not on my email list, you might want to head over to my website and jump on an email list. Uh, and I was, I'll make sure, you know, we, we know with social media, sometimes we don't see posts. So hopefully you'll see the email when I send it to you to let you know when pre-sales are open. So getting really excited about that. Now, on to today's episode. Today, I am having a chat with Dr. Emily Kybird. Emily's a chiropractor and a movement um, specialist. Uh, she is... <laughs> just incredible, really. Uh, She has the Hashimoto's herself. You know, she's a chiropractor who has, you know, worked with women with thyroid issues over many years now to lose weight, beat beat fatigue, and feel strong and confident. Uh, And because she's got um, Hashimoto's herself, she understands the different complexities that exercising and lifting weights uh, can have uh, on someone with a thyroid condition. So I had lots of questions myself. I've been trying to get into some strength-based training over the last year or so, and it's actually really helped um, heal some shoulder issues I've been having for a long time and uh, strengthen, it you know, just strengthen my body. So I definitely feel stronger than I did a year ago. And this was really, I found it a really helpful conversation because it helped me to understand why uh, I am prone to a bit of joint pain and muscle pain and, you know, um, fatigue, that sort of thing. So uh, I've just also this morning completed um, the first workout from Emily's program, Thyroid Strong. So we, we chat a bit, a bit bit about that and you'll find links in the show notes um, if you're wanting to find out more information about her program. Uh, but I really loved the way that she very calmly explained a very, you know, um, just really explained form. And I think that's something that I had been really afraid of uh, in lifting weights was injury and hurting myself. And a lot of that comes down to not doing things properly. So, you know, I just really loved the way that she really explained how to set up each exercise. But you're you're going to find in this conversation, we talk about, uh, well, obviously about weights and why, you know, weight training is really important for those of us with um, thyroid conditions. We talk about, um, you know, how important it is to work with someone who knows what <laughs> knows what they're doing, you know, in terms of a functional health practitioner. Uh, we, you know, we talk about um, the types of exercise that we shouldn't do, you know, for those of us with Hashimoto's and we, we want to be careful not to burn ourselves out and just lots of really practical tips around how to prepare for doing some strength-based training to make sure that we're doing it right, that we don't injure ourselves, and that Importantly, we feel strong and that we become resilient in our day-to-day life, that we can just cope with life better and you know the, the physical and the mental challenges that we deal with. So I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. Hi, and welcome to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast, where we discuss different aspects of living a healthy thyroid lifestyle, positively and practically, so that you can really thrive and not just survive. So join me, your host, Annabelle Bateman, and Let's Talk Thyroid. All right. Welcome, Emily, to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. Uh, I'm really, yeah, I've been really looking forward to this conversation all about exercise and body, you know, uh, body thyroid friendly exercise. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. So Emily, before we dive right into it, I was just saying before we hit record, the benefit of a thyroid specific podcast is we can really dive into some really specific topics. And I've got some, some great, um, yeah, I've got a few things that I've been wanting to, to understand a little bit more. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to uncover some of those body, you know, muscle joint exercise issue questions. But before we dive right into that, 
Uh, would you mind just telling uh, me and my listeners a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I am a chiropractor by training for the last 14 years. I had a practice in New York City called Urban Wellness Clinic, and we saw kind of like the corporate warrior, um, some celebrities, you know, you're like in the heart of New York. Mm, wow. And over the 14 years, the practice evolved to seeing women with autoimmune conditions. Uh-huh. And the reason that the practice evolved that, that way was because that was my own personal journey. Um, I have two kids. I have Elvis, who's six years old, and Brooklyn, who is two years old. And, you know, my journey began 18 months postpartum Uh and, you know, running a team of 10 and a clinic and kind of burning the candle at both ends really put a toll on my body. And some of the new mom things that came up, uh, I just accepted as my new norm. So I would tell my girlfriends, I am exhausted beyond like hit by a bus. And they would say, yeah, you're a new mom say, you know, my joints hurt. This is so weird, especially as a chiropractor. I don't want my joints hurting. I'm like, yeah, you're probably like picking your baby up and holding him. And the last thing was, I was like, I cannot lose these like 20 pound baby weight. And, you know, postpartum, you know, it's kind of different timeline for everyone, but 18 months, I was like, this cannot be my new norm Mm. because I cannot live my life this way. And I started to seek help, conventional medicine, endocrinologist, multiple functional medicine doctors, and then finally found uh, my functional medicine doctor now, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. And, you know, it was unfortunate because some of the previous doctors were only checking certain blood work, which I'm sure you've talked about. Yep. They were only checking TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, yep. and they weren't checking all the other tests. They weren't checking uh, thyroid antibody tests. So this was even the functional so, doctors you were seeing? Yes. And I was wow. doing protocol. I know it's surprising, right? And, you know, especially with certifications these days. I think mm. a lot of people call themselves functional medicine, but might not be yeah. as well as, you know, some who might be better trained. Mm-hmm. So she took, you know, tons of blood work and she's like, Em, you are on your way to an autoimmune condition. You have the presence of thyroid antibodies. Um, you have elevated TSH. We need to jump on this now and figure out what are some underlying root causes to get you on the right path. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at the time it was very overwhelming, especially trying to manage the rest of life with work. Yeah, and you've got a and, toddler. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I am very much the personality, personality of you give me a plan and I will execute on it. Mm-hmm. So if you tell me gluten-free, dairy-free, no alcohol, low histamine diet, I will do it. It's not, oh, but can I have a little croissant in the morning. It's like, I will do it. So started to walk that path and started to uncover some root causes, specifically environmental, that were kind of contributing to that inflammatory overload. Mm -hmm. Mother has thyroid, you know, issues. My sister has thyroid Uh issues. So obviously there's the genetic component, but I feel very grateful that I'm one of the, there's about 20% of women that can put their Hashimoto's into remission if caught early enough before there's too much destruction of the thyroid gland. And so I'm one of that 20% and I feel, you know, I kind of like thank the heavens and thank my functional medicine for putting me on that journey. And some of the environmental factors, which never, ever, ever would have thought of black mold Mm -hmm. in my apartment, you know, like, the, the laundry room always smelled a little mildewy. I thought it was mm. coming from the actual the washing machine, but it's actually coming from behind the wall. Oh, wow. Um, parasites. You know, I, I spent a year um, in Australia and <laughs> I traveled Southeast Asia and Fiji and, you know, you know, places where the water is not as clean yeah. and definitely had multiple friends living in my gut. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. And you know, when I was pregnant, I was pounding coffee and croissants every morning to give me that, An- that energy. Rush, <laughs> yeah. energy. Mm. So obviously started to change how I was eating first, uh-huh. started to look at environmental factors. And I probably, after about nine months, 
and I was doing different supplement protocols, started to feel better, mm. which I know for a lot of women, they may say nine months. That is a long time. But, you know, how long have we been maybe potentially beating ourselves up or being exposed to something that is not good for us? And one of the things that I overlooked at first was I was doing a ton of cardio and high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. So in the States, there's Soul Cycle, it's a spin class, okay. 45 minutes. Uh -huh. And I do two 45 minute back to back classes. They call it a double. So I'd be doing 90 minutes of spin probably four to five days a week. Yeah, because that's just where I'm... overachievers. <laughs> that's, a, that's an overachieving. I, I've done that. I, I did yoga for a while, but I, yoga was boring. So I did Bikram yoga, which is the, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and I did like the 30 day yeah. challenges where you do it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Burn yourself out. Yeah. It's part, it comes with part of the autoimmune picture, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it was, you know, a cultural messaging mm -hmm. of if you want to lose weight, work out more, move your body more, eat less. Yeah. Like I was eating under 1200 calories because I was physically working in my practice. Mm -hmm. I would have a coffee and croissant in the morning. Would not, I would not eat lunch. I would probably see patients through lunch and then I'd eat something for dinner and pass out. So I wish I had started to address the exercise piece earlier. Mm -hmm. and so I started to shift to uh, strength training um, and really dialed it back. Mm -hmm three days a week, 20 minutes. So what made you do that, me. Emily? Like what, what prompted you to do that? Part of it was the natural evolution of my practice. My practice had a trainer who was kettlebell focused. He was certified in strong first SFG. And I think it really came from my functional medicine doc, Dr. Lyon. Hmm. She really focuses on muscle. That is her specialty, okay. muscle and protein. So she wanted me to, you know, some of the first changes was protein. You're going to hit your optimal protein amount first per meal, 30 grams of protein per meal minimum. And it's going to, you know, create a satiation. It's going to help with muscle protein synthesis. And she's like, and you need to start doing weights. So it really came from that guidance of my doctor. Mm -hmm always been active and athletic um as a teenager and really used my workout to kind of blow off steam to de-stress mm. especially in new york and i think one of the shifts mentally that i had to make that i focus on for my women is when we're focusing on weight loss right because weight loss and fatigue are the two biggest struggles mm -hmm is to let go of this idea that we need to lose the fat. We always focus on the fat, the adipose tissue. And what if we shifted that mindset to focusing on the muscle mm. and really feeding the muscle through how we're eating and how we're uh, moving our body, strength training, and let that be the guide to getting strong, getting stable, losing weight with the focus on the muscle. So, and that really comes from my functional medicine doctor. And that comes from her mentor, Dr. Donna Lehman, mm -hmm. who studies, all he studies is muscle. Right. Muscle okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's that yeah. shift of focus from I'm trying to lose weight to I'm trying to maybe gain or build muscle. Yeah. yeah. Or maintain your muscle. Mm. So especially with the hypothyroid component, the underactive thyroid component in Hashimoto's, we already have a hard time maintaining our muscle. Like it's, it's already harder for us, right? Because of the uh, underactive hypothyroid component. So, you know, a lot of the women that I would see in my practice would have this like kind of a doughy appearance, kind of a skinny fat, right? Like they just don't have that tone and they actually have to focus more on the muscle. Mm -hmm. When we do a cardio, there's an element of muscle wasting. Mm -hmm. When we're focusing mm -hmm. on losing weight, part of the weight loss process is we lose some muscle mass. So what if we shifted the perspective of, oh, I gotta lose the fat to let's just maintain our muscle, feed the muscle properly, and like the fat will come off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess when you've had 
Oh, well, and I suppose it depends on where, where, when you're diagnosed and when, at what point in life you're dealing with this. But when you've really had a lifetime of thinking, like you said before, exercise more, push yourself. Like I thought for years, I was diagnosed at 23 and I'm now 47. So I've lived with this for a long time. And I was a teenager, really, I think it was triggered at puberty for me, so 12. So I spent those teenage years, really up to when I was diagnosed at 22, 23, overweight, tired. And I didn't really know why. I just thought I was greedy and lazy and I needed to work, eat less and exercise more. And I spent at least that 10 years and probably the 10 years after that doing that. And yeah. so to, it took... For me, it was a slightly different story, but it took me getting brain lesions and looking down the barrel of MS on top of the Hashimoto's to go, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't matter if I'm skinny. I just need to be healthy. So it was the shift to being well. I just need to be well. I don't. It doesn't matter if I am never a size 10. It doesn't matter. I just need to be well and healthy. And that was the kind of the trigger for me to switch gears in my whole, and I was already down the kind of holistic pathway, but sort of even further and particularly with the exercise to not force and push and what have you. But I think when you've spent a long period of time in that mindset, it is, I think for a lot of people, that's the struggle, isn't it? Uh, is to switch into, is to switch the mindset from, I don't have to actually be sweating my guts out and nearly vomiting, you know, <laughs> to get a good workout. Yeah. I think it's also a shift in a vanity or in a, a physical aesthetic mm. to kind of a deeper why. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, if I put my two kids together, they're about 70 pounds and both of them want to get carried down the stairs at the same time every single morning, right? So one gets on my back and one gets here. So I want to be able to do that and be a present mom and not have to worry about injuring myself. So for me, the strength is that reason yeah right not which i need a six pack and i think when we think of the physical aesthetic right a lot of people i know who have let's just say we'll just take a six pack in a very defined abdominal area it, there's a genetic component and then the second one if i think about some of my bodybuilder friends is they cycle so they cycle they're, they're eating more calories and they are training hard and it is muscle hypertrophy focus. And then they have a cycle of cutting where they're eating less calories, right? And I think sometimes culturally we see that kind of person and we think, oh, they must just do that all the time. But there's actually a cycle to it. It's not just this linear, always cutting, always trying to get more definition. Uh -huh. So... I think that is an element of the mind shift is not only going deeper to your deeper why. So I have, you know, clients who are like, I just want to be like a really amazing grandmother and I want to be present. Cause like when I see my kids it's for a short period of time, I have other people who want to be really resilient to what is going on in the world right now mm -hmm. with Rona and they want to be so bulletproof such that if they do get sick, they will be able to get out of that state. And really the one factor that is the determinant of that, of how well, not only we age, but recovering from a sickness is the amount of muscle mass we have on our body. Ah. It's not our vitamin D levels. It's not, you know, how much fish oil we're taking. It's like the more muscle mass we have, the better likelihood we will come out of a bedridden state. Mm -hmm. So I think going to that deeper why, and then also knowing, you know, if it's an aesthetic, really uh, getting clear on the why. Yeah. 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 There's always that mindset, um, that mindset component, but yeah. So thank you. I think that's really helped. That is really helpful. So maybe we can dive in. You said before, you know, those of us with hypothyroid, heart hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's have a struggle maintaining muscle. So can you just yeah. explain, I, I mean, that's going to feed into, I, I imagine the, um, the challenges that sometimes we can have uh, doing with, you know, with different kinds of exercise. So can you explain maybe some of those physical thyroid related challenges that, that we can have and like why, why they happen so that we can be aware of them? Cause it's, it certainly took me a long time to, really digest that. Yeah. 
I mean, thyroid hormone is required for every metabolic process in the body. For example, why when we have an underactive thyroid, we have a sluggish digestion, we're constipated, we have dry skin, right? Because of that underactive thyroid component. Um, we'll have hair loss, especially the outer third of the eyebrows. I had that and I was like, oh, that's weird. I, am I plucking too much? What's going on? <laughs> mm. And, you know, in the muscle joint pain kind of realm, we have more joint pain and more muscle aches. And we have all of our tissue regenerates and replenishes. But when we have an underactive thyroid, it's slower. So if we do a workout, the benefit from the workout happens in the recovery, right? That's when we, mm -hmm. the muscles, like if we, you know, if we're lifting a weight, we're tearing muscle, but then the healing of the muscle creates that muscle growth mm -hmm. and it takes longer to recover. So for example, like when I give someone a workout, I give them longer rest breaks. Like if you think about the traditional high intensity class, you're going hard for 40, 50 minutes, and then you get your rest break. Mm -hmm. but what if you did five reps of something like a deadlift, and then you took a one to three to five minute break so that you could catch your breath, you could recover. Um, so we just, we, we have a longer time regenerating our tissue. Mm -hmm. It's slower specifically in the tendons. So in the shoulder, right? The rotator cuff, in the knee, like the infra patellar tendon, you know, I hear so many women like, I don't want to get on the floor because I'm afraid I won't be able to get back up because my knee pain is so bad. And yeah, I've been stuck on the floor right. with back spasms before. That's pretty unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So especially in the tendons, it shows up, mm -hmm. right? So in addition to the inflammatory component of an autoimmune condition, mm -hmm. I see a lot of women, every single woman I've ever seen with a frozen shoulder, right? And a frozen shoulder is basically a contracture of the capsule of where the arm bone is in the socket. Basically, they like can't lift their elbow. They can't get their arm in the jacket. They can't mm -hmm. comb their hair. They can't wash their hair. They can't wash their armpit because they can't lift their arm. Yeah, right. And every single woman I ask, have you had your thyroid blood work checked a complete panel, not just TSH mm. and, you know, rehab for a frozen shoulder is 12 to 18 months. It is a long rehab, mm -hmm. usually two to three times a week in PT. And you'll see a lot of women, if they don't get their thyroid hormones in check, it will show up in the other shoulder a year later. So that's a really common thing I've seen is frozen shoulder, tendon pain. And so how can you give someone the tools to become more resilient mm -hmm. and more robust and stronger without pushing them into that place where they are so burnt out, they just want to cuddle under their weighted blanket for two yeah. days. Or <laughs> injured and then in kind of injured. rehab for 12 to 18 months to two years before they really feel like they can build again. Yeah. yeah. And so there, I, I mean, that was, that was kind of my journey and mm. my goal with women was how can I give them those tools without pushing them into that place of a Hashi flare up? Yeah. The other clinical observation was, and there is not research on it because I have looked on PubMed. Okay. Is this element of hypermobility and it's not every woman with the autoimmune condition, but I have noticed from just working like, oh, I know they have an autoimmune condition. I'm going to check what is called a Baton score. It's in the physical therapy world. And you just check certain joints to see if they have too much range, right? Is it within a healthy range? A lot of times doctors focus on limited range, but what if there's too much range? Mm -hmm. That's also not good. So for example, the knees, the elbows, the thumb, one is like where the thumb will touch the form, the pinky. And so I found that a lot of my women with an autoimmune condition also had this element of hypermobility. Mm -hmm. And it showed up where they would be standing and you would look at a profile of them and their knees would be like back behind their ankles. Mm. And they would be having knee pain because of that hyperextension. 
it's like, okay, is it the thyroid or is it the hyperextension? It's probably a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And they would come in and they'd want a massage and they'd want to get adjusted and they'd want to be given like foam rolling techniques for home. And no amount of the stretching, the yoga, the foam rolling is going to create that stability in a joint that is sloppy, right? You need to create integrity. And the only way you can do that is through creating integrity in the muscles that cross the joint. So a deadlift, right? Activating the hamstrings that cross the knee joint. And so a lot of the women were yogis and I was like, okay, no more yoga for two months. And I always felt like I was tearing out their soul. Mm. Like, oh, no yoga. I get, I'm like, I get it. It like clears the head, but let's just find another way. And I would put them on a strength training program and they would feel so much better. Mm. And I noticed, um, you know, part of an autoimmune condition is the mental aspect. There's depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Um, and I found, and again, just a clinical observation in my practice, when I created integrity in the joints, these women were more grounded. There was less panic attacks, less anxiety. Mm. So if you think about, if you're, if you're hanging on your joints and you don't feel grounded, right? Like you, you're, you're two feet on the ground, but you don't feel grounded because your joints are all sloppy. Like your energy is going to go up here, right? You're not going to feel mm. like calm, that feeling of safety. So when we started to create the muscular strength and integrity, mm. there was definitely a shift in how they showed up in the world. Wow. That's really right? interesting. Like, yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, I feel like in my work, I never had the courage to ask for a raise, but now I do or like getting out of a bad relationship or, you know, whatever it was mm. that they needed to kind of get through. So that was an interesting observation on an emotional level. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've seen a chiropractor for as long as I can remember. So I'm a big fan of your profession. Uh, and yeah. just within the same practice here in Brisbane, I've in, probably in the last, maybe not quite 12 months, started seeing a different practitioner within the practice. And he, he's, he's been really helpful. I had not frozen shoulder, but bursitis in the shoulder. And it took me two years to get rid of, to deal with that. And in the end, a lot of it was strength strength training, but very slow, very like really long, 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 long period of time. And yeah, he's been, he said very similar to what you've just said, you know, you're quite hypermobile. We've got to strengthen, you know, strengthen the muscles. I've had a lot of, it, I just, it moves in my body. It moves to different places. <laughs> so I've had a few years dealing with feet, a few years dealing with shoulder. I was this shoulder about five or six years ago. Now it's the right hip. And so he's like, right, well, we really have to work on your glute, you know, your glute strength. Like you, and you're not going to get that by, you know, yoga. Gosh. Exactly. Yeah, you right. have to be doing the weights for that. And so when I heard you talking with Ginny and saying, say, I'm like, right, okay, this is all kind of coming together. I can see how this all fits, uh, but really wanted to dive into it a bit more. And so I think, that's been really helpful for me to understand. Oh, okay. I, and I think I've never thought I'm not flex. I don't think of myself as flexible. I'm not flexible in terms of my muscles aren't flexy, but it, if the joints are hypermobile and I don't have the strength to actually support that, I can, I can see how that has caused problems for me. Yeah. So that's yeah. a really helpful explanation, I think. Yeah. And I think as women, sometimes we default to a lighter weight like a pink three to five pound hand weight. And the research shows that we need to hit a point of muscular fatigue to stimulate muscle protein synthesis in our resistance training. So you could do a deadlift with a 15 pound weight. How many reps is it going to take to get to that sense of, I cannot lift this one more rep? A lot, right? Mm -hmm. So I would rather give someone the tools of amazing form, teaching them how to find their breath and tank up and find their brace, pull that weight with good form and do less reps to avoid an overuse injury. So if it was five reps, 
at a heavier weight, you're you're gonna get the benefit of maintaining the muscle. Mm. Old research used to default to um, between eight to twelve or eight to fifteen reps. And like you know, a lot of trainers will be like, okay, three sets of fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> You give that to a woman with Hashimoto's and she's going to be like, <laughs> done. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one client I had, she was preparing for her wedding. She was seeing a trainer three days a week, 45 minutes of cardio, four, 45 minutes of resistance training. And then the other, there was three additional days, similar routine without them present. So six days, an hour and a half. Wow. She was gaining weight. And she was on a caloric restriction of 1200 calories and her trainer Mm. kind of on the side asked, you know, are you sure you're not sneaking food at night? You know, like I am on this program of move your body more, eat less, and you're gaining weight. Well, she was totally, you know, burning through her thyroid hormones and turning herself out, giving herself an element of adrenal insufficiency. And it's heartbreaking to you know, cause she was doing all the things. Mm. I think sometimes as women, we tell ourselves, oh, we got to get motivated. We got to get motivated. And then we get motivated and then we feel exhausted and terrible after. So I like to teach women to create the momentum over this idea of like, let's get motivated. So, um, usually my program is lower reps, heavier weight, but I teach you the good form and then long rest breaks, mm-hmm. which if you think about the power lifters, Olympic, like that's how they train. They don't mm-hmm. bang out a bunch of reps. They'll pull one or two reps and then they'll go take a walk for five minutes as their break. So, so it's interesting so, culture hold as women to do things a certain way. Yeah. So is the preventing injury. So I said, I, and I'm, I suppose I'm asking this from my own selfish perspective, <laughs> but if it's, if I have it, it's probably other people too. It's that, and I think I have in, I've injured myself definitely multiple times. So I get fearful of injury. And so mm. when I, I started, I really recognized at the beginning of last year, I, I really do need to do strength training. And then I started seeing the switch car practice, blah, 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 blah. So it's all sort of fit together, but I've taken it. I, I've not done what you said. I've, I've taken it very slow. Like I've got, I've built not, I mean, probably that sort of 10 to 12 reps. So not, but I've, I've lifted really light and built up to heavier, but not, I certainly wouldn't say even right now I'm lifting super heavy, but a lot heavier than I was 12 months ago, but I've tried to do that really slowly to prevent injury. Um, and maybe I could have pushed myself harder, but I, I suppose I'm trying to resist my own personality. That, you know, it likes to go hard and, so I don't know. How do you balance that sort of um, the, the the maybe we if we don't have the muscle and joint integrity, how do we how do we balance? Do you know what I'm asking? Like how do we balance that push and building strength without injury? And, and yeah. is that an entirely individual thing? And obviously form is important. And uh, is that what the answer is, or is there something else? Yeah, I think it's a couple things. I think. For example, for a deadlift, I start people at 50 pounds, which is 24 kilo. Yep. Which, you know, if you asked a trainer, they'd be like, that's not that much. But for a woman who only walks as her form of exercise, that could feel like a lot. So uh, I like to teach people movements based on how we learn to move as babies. So we had this neurological patterning. And we hit milestones, right? So from month three to month six, all we learned to do was to lift our knees to 90 and breathe into our belly and brace. And so if you train someone in that same movement pattern, you know, we didn't walk before he crawled. Yeah. You know? Okay. Like, yep. For all we like rocked on our hands and knees. So I use a warm up um, based on how we learn to move as babies to kind of do a little neurological priming. Mm-hmm. So I think- I'm just going to interrupt the conversation here because you've just heard about my fears, uh, our concerns around strength-based training for me. Well, after the episode, uh, I 
got access to the Thyroid Strong program, which Emily's going to tell you a little bit more about at the end of the program. Uh, and she has given us access to the program for a hundred US dollars off. So I just wanted to let you know about that. If you want to purchase Thyroid Strong, you can do so through the links that I will provide in the show notes and on my website. You've got two weeks to claim the hundred dollar off uh, pr promo uh, and I will receive a small commission from that for which will be really helpful for supporting the show and covering the costs of the podcast. So if you do want to, if you do want to give Thyroid Strong a go, I'd love it if you would use that link. Of course, you don't have to, but if you would like to, that would be great because that will help support the show as well. Now, I have done one of the workouts. I've looked at a lot of the preliminary videos um, and done a couple of the rehab videos. She's very meticulous in the way she explains how to do you know, set up each exercise, which I think is really important. And so if you've got any questions about my experience of the program as I'm doing it, uh, obviously I haven't finished it yet. I've just started, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So send me a message and we can have a chat about it. So I think that's one thing. Yeah. I think um, when we are, when we, as women, when we are told to engage our core, it's a very nebulous term, right? Mm. Like, do we suck in? Do we like do a crunch? Do we breathe and brace? And I don't know why, like I see men do it easier. Maybe because like little boys punch each other and so you have to kind of learn how to <laughs> brace your core. But I think there is a Pilates-esque style where we are told, pull our belly to our spine. Um, suck your belly in, right? Mm. And when you pick up a weight, like all of that is fine for Pilates, but when you pick up a weight, you don't want to do that because that will create compression of the joints, the facet joints on the back of the spine. So if you look at how a baby, like they look like they have a Buddha belly, they breathe down and wide mm. and then they kind of keep it. They don't necessarily push their belly out, but they keep it tanked up and then they move. So it's the same thing happens when you lift a weight. Like you don't, if you lift a weight and you pulled your belly towards your spine, you're going to be using the joints versus that intra abdominal pressure. Okay. Yep. So I think, I think that's part of it. Mm. I think I'm kind of told to suck in. Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, you know, when's the last time we learned how to lift a weight? You know, like maybe high school, maybe college, yeah. maybe rider trainer. Yeah. Just like trying to get us to sweat. Mm. And so there is this aspect of good form and form not to use. Mm. And I don't think it's on social media. Often I think on social media, it's a lot of not so great form. And um, I think I like to think of lifting weights as e like every single rep is an amazing rep of one versus like, oh, I got to get through these 10 reps and really getting out of here because we're, you know, on our computer and phones all day mm. and really feeling in our body. Yeah. So, yeah, so every rep is set up well. You know, you've, you've got that intra-abdominal breathing, you positioned in the right way. Is that what you're saying? So really kind of get the best value out of each rep. Yeah. So, for example, like I do kettlebell swings. Mm -hmm. If I start to feel that I am arching my back mm -hmm. when I fatigue, I park the bell. I don't push through to my hundred swings. I just park it. I reset. Um, and I don't think we're trained to do that. I think we're trained to just push through yeah. and get them done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I think you're right. And I think, um, I mean, historically, uh, you know, I suppose I, I've thought of, you know, lifting weights as, is, as, as, a bit boring. Whereas, you know, that whole kind of push yourself, you know, in a, in a boxing class or in a your spin class or whatever is sort of, you know, you're so absorbed in that. Whereas I, th I think what you the way you're describing really engaging your mind and body in every rep makes it much more mentally engaging, I suppose, to do the way it's not just kind of pumping out some reps. It's actually a whole, 
body mind experience a bit like pilates is you know you can't be mind wandering when you're focusing on where everything should be and it's really you're saying it's exactly should be like that yeah yeah exactly and i think when you start to create that mind body experience Mm. start to notice shifts so i did an experiment on myself where i only did ten thousand steps a day for three weeks because I wanted to really experience, I experienced like some of the people coming into my program, that's all they've done. <laughs> so I want to know what that's like. And after a week, I was slightly depressed. I was kind of questioning the purpose of my life on earth. And I was like, why am I so low energy, like mm. low vibration? Where is this, where's this sense of like abundance and positivity? And I literally thought, is it because I'm not doing strength training Mm. and I finished my three week experiment and I felt terrible. My joints were aching. My SI joints, like right at the base of my low back were cranky. And I just did a 20 minute kettlebell workout, low reps, heavier weight, long rest breaks. And I felt like my heart was burnt. I was like, Oh, this (laughs) is what I was missing. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, when I feel low vibration or low energy, I ask myself three questions. I ask, okay, how have I been eating? Have I been eating, hitting my optimal protein targets? Mm -hmm. Have I um, been eating in an eight hour window? So a time restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. So like 18, eight hours on 16 hour break. Yep. And I ask myself that. And then I ask myself, okay, how's my sleep? My two year old loves to like wake me up at two. Yeah. So yeah. My sleep. And then the last thing is like, okay, have I worked out in the last three days? Mm. So I kind of do the foundational stuff when I feel like I'm in a funk. Um, And I'm usually like, okay, one of those things is off. So, yeah. So interesting that you, yeah, you obviously, you pulled the weights out for those three weeks and then, yeah, that made a really big difference, even though you're walking a lot, you know, that that's still, yeah. Yeah. I mean, walking. It's gorgeous in Colorado. I'm listening to podcasts, like all the things I love yeah. and it's hurt. And I felt exhausted. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I was like, okay, I get where my women are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good, <laughs> yeah. yeah, a good experiment. It's a bit like, well, not quite like, but like the guy that ate McDonald's, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Although you did a much healthier version than that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the walking walking for three weeks a bit healthier than just eating mcdonald's yeah but if you think about i mean conventional medicine as well as a lot of functional medicine doctors their recommendation for exercise is walking mm. low impact which is like okay what does that mean swimming maybe uh pilates and yoga because they don't want to overdo it mm. but none of those focus on the muscle tissue yeah. So do you recommend doing some of those as well or uh, just the the weights? What do, what do you recommend? Yeah. I mean, this is coming from a yoga instructor. Like I taught uh-huh. yoga in New York for years. Okay. Um, so sometimes there's, it's almost like there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's too many factors. So I like to just like pull everything out and Sometimes people ask, oh, well, can I do spinning on my off days? And it's like, well, let's just like, I don't want you to do spinning and then blame the weights yeah. for soreness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I build women up to three days a week of strength training, 20 to 30 minutes. The benefit of that is their newfound strength will carry over into whatever they want to do, right? So if they want to walk or they want to do spinning, um, they want to do the strength training to create the integrity and then do the yoga to lose the integrity of the joint. You know, it, it just makes it better for whatever, ex- whatever they want to do in their daily mm. life. So I like to create that baseline three days a week, 20, 30 minutes, yep. do that for six weeks and then start to integrate things back mm-hmm. in those things that fill the soul. If it's yoga, fine. Um, so that, that's my approach. Cause then there's like a little control. There's like not too many factors to figure out, okay, what is causing a symptom mm. that might come up? Yeah. So they're like your big rocks, you know, uh, do you know the big rock thing? Yeah. yeah. So you put the big rocks in yeah. and then if there's room for other things, but you've got that as your foundation. Yeah. I like that. And it sounds really yeah. achievable, doesn't it? Even if you said 30 minutes, three times, 20, 20 to 30 minutes, three times a week. 
is not a big commitment. It's not. Yeah. And so tell us while we're yeah. talking about the way that you work with women, I know you've got a program called Thyroid Strong. And actually I found, I've got, I've had this t-shirt. I'll stand up so you can see it. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, let's see. Oh, it says it's like stronger than, for those that are listening, it says stronger than, you know, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So I wore that for you. <laughs> well, I wear it for me actually, <laughs> but, but I wore it for you today. <laughs> so tell us about Thyroid Strong. So it is a kettlebell based strength program that you can do at home. Kettlebells are nice because they are very forgiving when you're first learning form compared to a dumbbell or barbell. Okay. Like you can kind of not have the perfect form of kettlebells and you're not going to injure yourself. The other thing is when you hold a kettlebell, like let's say the bells on the back of your wrist here, it is activating um neurological pathways in the body so for example Hmm. when you grab like let's say you do um, a heavy carry like a farmer's walk like the bell is down towards your side if you did that with a dumbbell it's going to kind of like hit your legs and it's kind of annoying but if you hold them down to your side with a loose grip like just kind of like feel what's going on in your body and then you literally like death squeeze them, especially with your fourth and your fifth finger, you will feel muscles in your in your shoulder girdle start to stabilize uh-huh. your lats, your spinous interior. And it's hard to activate using other tools. So that's just one example of like why a kettlebell is good when you are teaching form. Mm-hmm. And you know the structure is like I said, three workouts a week. 20 to 30 minutes, long rest breaks. And it's just starting to create that momentum, right? You just need to give people a taste of knowing that they are stronger. <laughs> yeah. They ever imagined. Yeah. Yeah. And women, I've had women purchase a kettlebell and they'll, they'll text me and say, I'm a little nervous. Just bringing the 12 kilo kettlebell from the porch into the house felt like a workout. And now those women swing kettlebells, they clean, they snatch it above head, they press, and just really gives a sense of accomplishment and going back to like stronger than they ever imagined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which you're not going to get that sensation when you are just walking, right? Or yeah. just hitting, doing like a little exercise. The other really amazing thing with the course is. I am not a Hashimoto's expert in terms of environmental factors and diet. I had to do it for myself, but not my, like I'm, I'm an exercise gal. Yep. And so I have friends that are functional medicine doctors who adrenal insufficiency is their forte, mold exposure and how to remediate is their forte and how to detox. So there is this bonus vault of interviews with them because I think, you know, a lot of women in the States specifically the closest doctor is three hours away. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh, it's the same in Australia. It's the same. Yeah. 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 Like if they were inland or yeah. 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 So I think it's important for women to educate themselves to, first of all, that kind of stuff is like a different language, right? So you're like, Oh, mold, stachybotrys, aspergillus. Um, Oh, but what about the mycotoxin that get off gas? You know, the VOCs, it's another language. So it's nice to like, start to introduce that language and for women to start to empower themselves. Like, Oh, did I have water damage that I don't know? Yeah. That I just was like, oh, oh, totally. Yeah. It's, that's, yeah. it's that built. I call that them that sort of information. Like they're part of your support team. They're just an online component, you know, and we need a really yeah. broad support team because we, yeah, we yeah. need to educate ourselves and empower ourselves. So yeah, that sounds fabulous. Yeah. And I think the other really cool aspect is, how many times have we done a group workout or group challenge or like a beach body bikini thing? And all these people are dropping in the comments about the results. And, you know, I've done this. I'm like, I'm not getting those results probably because I'm built differently because I have an autoimmune condition. So it's really cool because every single woman has a thyroid uh-huh. condition, yeah. has Hashimoto's. Mm. You know, they can relate to each other and it feels like this community that you always wish you had, Mm. you know, I had one woman tell her husband kind of like grumbling about 
weight loss before she did thyroid strong. Yeah. And he told her to go put her running shoes on and go out the door and go for a run. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And he went, you know, and it was, it's like heartbreaking to hear that. Mm. Yet at the same time, it's the cultural yep. thing that we're told. Yep. And there's a better way to do it. So I think that's another cool aspect is. You know, yeah. There's the community like, oh, aspect to it. Yeah. 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 That's great. And so, um, how can people find out, how can people connect with you and maybe find out about thyroid strong? Yeah. So Dr. Emily Kybird across all platforms. Okay. Yep. That's <laughs> easy. Yep. That's good. Yep. yep. And you know, I do, I do a lot of workout tips on Instagram and I'm going to start doing it on YouTube. Um, cause I think a lot of women have struggled. So for example, pain that moves around the body mm-hmm. with no clear explanation. There's no clear mechanism. You didn't just like fall on an outstretched hand to hurt your shoulder, right? You know, for someone who doesn't know that they have an autoimmune condition, like thinking, what's wrong with me? Yeah. So when I see women, they're like, oh yeah. And then my, my thumb and then next week is my ankle and then my shoulder. I think, okay, you you probably got it. <laughs> yeah. So you can use it diagnostically in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So, yeah. 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 So, and I'll make sure I put all the links, you know, in the show notes and everything as well. But Emily, is there something that I haven't asked you that you think my thyroid audience would like to know or benefit from knowing or, you know, any other tips that you'd like to share with us? Yeah. I, I, I talk a lot about momentum over motivation. And I truly believe in doing the hard things, which might be hard to digest when we're in the darkest depths of our autoimmune condition. Mm -hmm. And I think the third piece is working with a really good practitioner who can not only identify triggers, but then can put them in a hierarchy of what to treat first. Yeah. I think mediocre practitioners try to treat everything at once. Mm -hmm. And I think a good practitioner knows, okay, this is the most important. We have to treat this before this. Mm. We have to treat it. We have to treat a parasite before SIBO and on and on. So, and if you're not getting answers, you feel weird with your practitioner, keep hunting. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's really good advice. Yeah. Well, and obviously you did that, you know, you went through a, a, a few. So how did you find Dr. Gabrielle Lyons in the end? (laughs) <laughs> uh, we have a common girlfriend, uh, a physical therapist who's amazing. She's in San Diego named Megan Helwig. Um, and she said, Hey, why don't you see my friend Gabrielle? She's literally two blocks from your office in New York. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh yeah. And then we started, um, sharing patients. Cool. So yeah. She was that's working- cool. An aspect and I was working on the muscle. Yeah, well, how fabulous. And, and, um, yeah. and I think I was reading that you've moved to Colorado now. So you've left the big, the big city lights and headed for the mountains. Yeah. I think the thought of having another potential lockdown. Uh huh. Yeah. New York's been pretty full on, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, literally. So the parks have fences, right? Locked the parks. I was like, where's my kids going to play? They've done that in Melbourne too. Yeah. 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 So that thought, I mean, if I didn't have kids, I'd probably still be in New York. Okay. Yeah. I do love the mountains and it is so much healthier and better on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And being able to see the horizon and the sunset is truly amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, what is, I imagine it's a big change. So that's, that's good. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing so much valuable information. I, I've learned things. It's really been helpful even for me. I know, I know that my listeners will um, love you and, you know, really benefit because it is, it is a piece of the puzzle that can take a long time to get right and keep right and stay on. So, you know, really, really value your expertise. So thank you. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. I would love it if you enjoyed it, if you would hit subscribe and the bell, that would be really helpful. Uh, Even more helpful actually would be to share it with someone else who you know has thyroid issues or you think would benefit from listening. That really is part of my mission, I suppose, is to spread the message of positive and practical approach to managing your thyroid health so that people really kind of have more energy to get on with living their life and not just some kind of trudging through each day. So spreading that word really genuinely helps um, other people feel better, live better, be better. Uh, The best way that you can connect with me is through my um, website, which is AnnabelleBateman.com. From there, really, you'll be able to connect in all the other ways. I would love it if you would join my Facebook community group. Um, There's lots of uh, great support there. It's all free. Uh, that and that's you know just being with like-minded people Uh, but from the website you can also book a strategy session with me so if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed not not too sure where to start then um, book a strategy session there's also freebies to download and links to look at my online courses or purchase some essential oils or or one or my cookbook so that's really the hub would be annabellebateman.com but look forward to connecting with you and um, yeah just being in this thyroid health journey together have a great day bye the information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional